Uh, good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting in 2022 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. There are no apologies from members, although um, Colin Beatty, the Deputy Convener, will be joining us about 10 o'clock. So our first item of business is a decision to take item three in private. Are members content? Thank you. So our next item of business is an evidence session with the Just Transition Commission. And the purpose of this morning's meeting is to provide members with an introduction to the work of the Commission. And I welcome Professor Jim Ski, Chair of the Just Transition Commission, who's joined by Elliot Ross, Head of the Commission Secretariat. Um, as always, I ask members and witnesses to keep answers and questions as concise as possible. And I invite Professor Ski to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, uh, we really welcome this opportunity uh, to come and speak to the committee and apologise for not being here in, in uh, person at the moment. Uh, five members of the Commission were in Egypt uh, last week for COP27 and, frankly, are still in recovery uh, mode at the moment. So what, I'd, what I thought I would use the, just these introductory remarks for is just to say about what we think about the concept of just transition and then just say just a little bit about uh, how, how we're planning to take this forward at the moment. Now, the surprising thing is, if you look for a definition of just transition on the internet, you will not find one. Uh, basically, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, which led on the concept, has a set of principles, which uh, are, are basically about fairness of outcome and process, but they don't actually trouble themselves with the definition. Uh, in our first report, of the, or the report of the first Just Transition, we said that the imperative of Just Transition is that we have policies that ensure the benefits of climate change action are shared widely, while the costs do not unfairly burden the least able to pay, or whose livelihoods are directly or indirectly at risk when the economy shifts and changes. So, the, I mean, the key points about that, it emphasises opportunities from the net zero transition as well as uh, potential difficulties and risks. And it also implies a wider scope. It's not just about getting out of coal or getting out of oil and gas. Uh, we, we would cover, for example, the agriculture and land use sectors and the impacts of the change on consumers and, the, and their ability to pay. So quite a wide scope. So when we produced the first report 18 months ago, we had 24 recommendations in all, but they were, they were clustered around four themes. The first one being the need for planning so that everybody is operating off the same page. The second one on the importance of upskilling up and the transference of skills. Third one on engagement with our stakeholders that were, uh, are affected. And fourthly, a consideration of the distribution of costs and benefits. And importantly, also a recommendation that there be a minister for just transition. And of course, the Scottish Government accepted all these recommendations. And we now have Richard Lockhead in his role as the uh, Minister for Just Transition. So as we've moved into the second phase, the game has changed a bit, because in phase one, it was essentially operating at a strategic level. Now we're much more talking about implementation and delivery, and that provides a new set of challenges. And it's also a busier landscape, we're having a minister and the Commission as well. So in terms of how the Commission positions it itself, I actually looked at my personal appointment letter that I received from the Minister, which talks about taking a strong, healthy challenge function, carefully scrutinising planned and underlying assumptions before decisions are taken. So basically, the, the function of the Commission in its new phase is advice to the Scottish governments and scrutiny in, in, in terms of progress uh, with advancing things. So the elements of our work plan, uh, the government is working towards just transition sectoral plans, which will cover energy, buildings and construction, transport, agriculture and land use, and also a place-based one for the Grangemouth cluster. Uh, the question of engagement uh, is still on our agenda. We've had five meetings of this year, and the latter three have all, all been place-based in Aberdeen, Blantyre and in the Outer Hebrides. We have a big attention to monitoring and, in, uh, monitoring and evaluation. How do we actually measure the progress towards just transition? And we are also asked to coordinate with, with, with other relevant bodies, which includes the, uh, the Committee on Climate Change, the Fair Work Convention. 
Now, in terms of where we've got to at the moment, I think we're still finding our feet in this new phase, but just uh, three challenges that have come up. First of all, we had originally anticipated that the just transition sectoral plans would come sequentially, and we appointed our membership, or the minister appointed the membership on that basis. Uh, so what we had was a number of commission members who would be there for the entire parliament, and some who would be on a fixed term to cover the production of each just transition sectoral plan. In fact, these just transition plans are now all going to be in parallel rather than sequential, which means we've had to rethink our sort of governance a little. So we're placing a bit more emphasis on establishing working groups for each topic, which we, from which we can then co-opt co members. I think we are once again struggling with the breadth of the agenda of just transition, which, which I, I guess we, we may get, get on to. 2023, we're going to be very busy with the just transition sectoral plans. It leaves less scope for the cross-cutting topics uh, that we'd hoped we would be able to cover. And so we're going to need to be a bit more selective, and we will be having a strategy meeting at the beginning of next month to work through these issues. And finally, I think the challenge is the relationship with uh, with, with, with the new minister. This was not something we had in the first phase. So we are just working through our ability to what extent is the advice we are giving proactive, are we defining the agenda, and to what extent are we responding to requests from the Scottish Government. If I'm, I've probably gone on a bit too long, but if I might make one more remark, it's just a flat coming back from Egypt last week. It was remarkable how Scotland is still in the international spotlight. Uh, we had five Commission members there, and I can say that uh, our activities were spontaneously mentioned in the context of the global stock take for the Paris Agreement by various countries and also members of international organisations like the International Labour Organisation. So, uh, no pressure on us. Uh, people have quite a lot of high expectations, and we know that we have to deliver over the next three to four years. But maybe I will stop it here. Um, thank you very much, Professor Ski. You have raised a number of issues that um, I am sure members will want to ask questions around. I suppose I am interested in, you have spoken about the sectoral plans, and I think we were due one towards the end of this year on energy being the first one that is anticipated. And then you have spoken about you know, commission members and strategies and, and all that kind of stuff, but do you feel there is enough action and actual activity taking place, or are we still at very much a planning stage? Because the targets we have to reach are by 2045. Um, so is there enough balance on the actual actions being in place rather than just strategies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very to say that there is a big sense of urgency about this. And I think that, that that's an, an explanation as why uh, maybe the, the first plans need to be produced in parallel. Uh, rather than sequentially. We are expecting a skeleton just transition sectoral plan for energy uh, by the end of the year, on which we will be providing advice when we see what the skeleton looks like. The expectation is that all four of the first uh, just transition sectoral plans would come out in 2023. I do not know if El Elliot is more in day-to-day -day touch with the Scottish Government on these issues. I do not know if Elliot has anything to add there. Uh, sure. Good morning, committee. Um, uh, my expectation is that the um, the draft plan for energy will be published uh, before the end of the year, and there will be a formal consultation period open at that point, which the JTC will uh, make a submission. And then I think there is going to be further engagement before um, that plan is finally published at the end of next year. Okay. Thank you. And then, Professor Ski, you did make some comments to one to end that maybe raise some questions around what the role of the Just Transition Commission is, that there should be a lack of clarity now around what the what is expected of Commission members? No, I, I, I think, um, you know, at, you know there's just a few lines in the terms of reference for the Commission. Which, there's a few lines in the, the terms of reference for the Commission which talk about the need to provide advice and scrutiny. So the broad direction, uh, I think, think, is really quite clear. Uh, the scrutiny will come mainly on the just transition sectoral plans, and that's quite clear. We need something from government to which we can react. But in terms of the advice, I think we can. We the, the debate is how much of a proactive role 
in sort of providing advice on questions that the uh, Scottish Government has not posed to us. And I think the mood of the Commission at the last meeting was that we should very much take up that, uh, that, that, that proactive role. Okay, thank you. And I think you also mentioned measuring progress. Um, how do we measure progress? We do have a target of 2045, so how do we chart and measure progress towards that? And when, when will that actually start? I suppose you're talking about 2023 is when we have the sectoral plans and there'll be consultation on the sectoral plans. So the time for activity, we're probably looking towards, I don't know, 2025, a kind of 20 year time scale. Are there targets? Is there, how is progress going to be measured during that period? Yeah, uh, I mean, what, what we, we really need to work on this monitoring and evaluation aspect of it. The Scottish Government has held uh, one uh, stakeholder meeting with a set of consultants, uh, and uh, a second meeting, I understand, uh, was postponed while they, they work out where, where precisely to take it next. The committee, uh, the Commission has offered the Scottish Government assistance in identifying benchmarks and indicators that would help us to measure progress. And we've had a, a positive response from the, uh, from the government on that one. But it's absolutely critical that we, we have indicators, you know, very specific things, and they might be, for example, like changes, changes in labour markets, training, impacts of uh, electricity prices and gas prices on different classes of consumer, the kind of things that would allow us to measure the fairness and the, the distribution of the you know the opportunities and the uh, and the risks associated uh, with, with the transition. And yes, it's really important to do that. And I think the analogy there would be with the, the role that the committee on climate change uh, plays with respect to the more quantitative aspect around uh, emission indicators, etc. Whereas the indicators that we would be pursuing would be much more about the how you get there and, and what the impacts are on fairness and, and equity. And again, I don't know if, if Elliot wants to add anything to that. Just maybe to underline that there is a section on, mon on the kind of high level priorities that the Commission um, has set out around the work that they'd um, hope the Scottish Government would be taking forward on monitoring ev and evaluation. Um, but perhaps also just to say that the Commission itself, as currently constituted, isn't per se a monitoring body, um, but there could be a space for such a body on just transition um, outcomes and processes in the future, I suspect. I suppose, Tide, I'll just, I'm going to move to um, Maggie Chapman in a second, but one final question was tied to benchmarking. The decision on what to benchmark does lead to an understanding of what just transitions means. Um, I mean, do you feel there's a shared understanding across government and policy makers around uh, what will be what the benchmarks are expected to be? Um, is it too broad a term or is there an understanding of what we should be looking to measure? Yeah, maybe maybe if I can come in this, I, I think the, the, the understanding is still at a very broad level at the moment. I mean, we really need get, to get down to very specific indicators. And one of the things that the Commission has discussed internally is that the monitoring and evaluation must be quite closely tied to stakeholder engagement, because we need indicators that uh, people feel are relevant to them, not just indicators that are cooked up by consultants or, or other people. So we, we see a strong link between the monitoring and evaluation and the stakeholder engagement side. You, Professor Ski, you, you referred to an engagement event in Aberdeen. Is that part of that work? It, was not, it wasn't part of that work. What, what we do is for each of the committee meeting, commission meetings, what we try to do is uh, we try to get out of Edinburgh and Glasgow, or the central belt, and hold the meetings in places that are relevant to the topic under consideration. So when we went to Aberdeen and Peter, Be Peter Head, we were looking at basically the issue of carbon capture, utilisation and storage. That was the theme of the meeting. And, and that was the location. Uh, we, will, we visited the built environment sustainable transformation uh, place at, uh, at Blantyre, where we were thinking about building and construction. That's the kind of theme. I think we would need different kind of events to open up the monitoring and evaluation uh, agenda. Thank you. Uh, Maggie Chapman to be followed by Michelle Thompson. 
Thanks very much. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Professor Ski. Thank you very much for your, your opening r remarks and, and what you've said so far. I'm, I'm interested in exploring an issue you, you, you raised in the first phase of your work. You, you talked about planning being one of the focuses, planning and that sort of strategic uh, thinking for, for future. We've heard calls in addition to the calls you have made around the clarity needed or, or perhaps a potential lack of clarity around the pipeline of work that we need to, to transition to net zero, I'm interested if you think we are, we've done the work needed to understand the detail of, of, uh, across the different sectors, across, across the, the, the different um, elements of this. Do, do we have that level of detail or is, is there still quite a lot of, of work to understand where we want to get to, never mind how? how we get there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, frankly, I do think a lot of a lot of more work is, is actually uh, needed uh, on, on that point. In our uh, report that we produced in, in July this year, we were very keen to get an initial report out to sort, sort of set out our stall in the early stage of the Commission. We called for an energy uh, roadmap as, as part of an energy sector just transition plan with quite a lot of specificity in it, for example, annual indicators, uh, so that people would understand where they're going. And when the uh, draft plan, energy, uh, the draft just transition plan for energy comes out, I think that that will be the kind of thing that we will be looking for in that. But uh, Elliot, I, I can see you've turned on um, the camera. <laughs> Sorry, am I coming through? Um, I think I, I think I'd probably just say, yeah, from, from from the perspective of most of the commissioners and and what's in our, our report, I think there is quite a lot more work that needs to be that needs to be done in that space. Okay, th th thanks. I, I suppose what, one of the things I'm I'm conscious a, a potential pitfall or a potential problem is if we see just transition as something separate from working alongside Scotland's <laughs> other economic and, and social priorities. And I'm wondering, in, in your view, are there dangers of viewing just transition as something not actually foundational and core to our entire economic uh, planning and, and strategic thinking? And I suppose similarly, are there dangers of viewing the, the work that we need to do around adaptation as separate, as, as a distinct thing, not something that we, we look at and we talk about in the just transition space? I I yeah, I, I mean, Sorry. If, I could, if, I, if I could come back on, back on that one, uh, we have already established a number of working groups uh, that, that are looking at cross-cutting issues apart from the, the sectoral plans. And one of one of these working groups is actually on social social infrastructure, and this would very much, uh, you know, try to connect to the just transition agenda to wider concepts of well well being. Uh, for for example, that ties it in elsewhere in the economy. In the economy, we have a separate group on finance, uh, which would also be cross cutting. One of our challenges for next year is the time we have available to invest in these cross cutting topics given the pressure of work that will come from scrutinising the, the uh, just transition sectoral plans. And the, the point of adaptation uh, has been raised. And just to say, this is a conversation that has been taking place. I have had a conversation with the Scottish Government where there was a keenness to bring adaptation within the framework of just transition, as well as the mitigation and emission reduction opportunities. We would need to discuss this a little bit more in the Commission to understand, we, do we have the expertise to do this? It might well tie into the question of social infrastructure and the ability to cope uh, with the kind of physical impacts of climate change as, as well. So it, it's on the agenda, but it's not built into our work plan at the moment, I, I should say. Okay, thanks. And, and my last my last question for now, if that's okay. I suppose in, in the conversations that you've had within the Commission, but also more broadly with the Scottish Government and, and other stakeholders, um, do you think there are any policies or proposals that are potentially uh, red herrings, I suppose, in, in terms, given, given the time pressures, given what we know are going to be very financially constrained um, at times ahead, are there things that we, we maybe need to move away from doing because we know we can get uh, better impact, better outcomes from, from focusing on, on, on other things. Are there red herrings, I suppose, is what I'm asking. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess one of the one of the challenges uh, I think that we have there is twenty forty five is just so ambitious. The net zero target. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a tendency to spring the phrase "just transition" around as though it's magic dust that uh, makes makes everything easy. It is not easy, and we need to be very clear about that. And it's very difficult, I think, to drop some of the challenges off the agenda without actually posing risks to the achievement of the 2045 target. So, I mean, the, I mean, the big, big topics, I think, in terms of 2045 are obviously the further development of renewable renewable energy, and I think you, you know that that is that is well under under way at the moment. The the tricky one is the question of energy efficiency in buildings and the implications through for fuel poverty, which is a major one. And there's something that m many of the commissioners are still struggling with is the the question of agriculture and land use, in particular the inter the uh, interaction with land reform, because there are very interesting in incentives or disincentives in that area uh, that, that, that do need to be addressed. And of course, all of these dimensions have implications for equity and labour markets, in particular the movement away from old energy, if I can put it that way, for oil and gas to new energy with renewables, where, where the, you know, the, the challenges are large. But honestly, 2045 net zero is so ambitious, I think it is very hard to leave anything off the table. Okay. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Uh, Michelle Thompson to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Uh, good morning. Uh, I absolutely uh, appreciate the complexity and the challenge of what you've, uh, you're trying to do. Uh, I'm entirely uh, sympathetic to that. Uh, one of the two areas I often major on are around uh, the inclusion of women. Uh, and I just wanted to ask a question about that. Now, I re recall for uh, COP26, the First Minister described the Scottish Government as a commitment maker, and that commitment included enabling women and girls to lead a just transition to a green economy. Now, I am fully cognisant of the complexity of this, so I really just wanted to ask for a progress update, and I note the very eminent women that you have on your uh, advisory committee, but an update would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we, we are, I think, gender balanced on the on the commission, and I think that that was something that was very consciously striven for. And from my perspective, you, you know that that is that that is is working really well. The question is, you know, also how how gender works into some of the substantive topics that the commission is addressing, and I think uh, you know in terms of. I think it's important there in terms of skills and education to make sure, for example, that you know that you, you that girls are are really brought into STEM subjects, for example, for where the demand the demand for skills is very high. Some of the, uh, the, the 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 initial discussions on social infrastructure that I was talking about were noting the fact that you know women are quite well representative in in sectors like social work. So, believe me, the subject has, has been hot on the Commission itself. We are gender balanced, but we are also talking about the subject in, in quite a, a conscious kind of way. So, therefore, following on from that, will there, in terms of any measurement outcomes, will there be a specific measurement referencing uh, gender equality? or cut through all your outcomes is another way to do it, but will there be specific measures? Well, I, I think the way to the approach to this would be in terms of specific measures. So, for example, if we were looking at labour market outcomes or looking at progress uh, with skills and training, then introducing a, a specific gender into, element into that, for me, would make a, a, absolute sense. And once we have these sort of underlying facts, perhaps we can put together a larger narrative uh, uh, about uh, where further progress is needed. Okay. I mean, I, I will look forward to, to following that up. My last question around this area, and I've got another one as well, is in terms of conditionality. Can you see a set of circumstances where you'd be advising conditionality in kind of gender parity? to the, the Scottish Government, because often it is these hard measures in real financial outcomes that make the difference. I wonder if you have got any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah. We, we have not discussed that issue in, in, the, in the Commission so far, but thanks for planting, 
planting the thought because we could well do that. In terms of things like commission conditionality in general, we have actually discussed issues like uh, local content requirement, uh, local content requirements, and public procurement. So the subject of conditionality has been on the table for us. It has not yet been applied, you know, to, to gender gender equality. But you have uh, actually very helpfully planted that thought there. I think. Okay, thank you. We've got another question, a completely different area around financing. I mean, it's everybody is well aware of the significant challenges of financing, particularly for the Scottish Government in terms of fixed budget. And of course, there are, even in the private sector, there are challenges around financing and kind of risk appetites change where there's more shortage of resources. So I just wanted to get a sense from you. Uh, I mean, I'm well aware of the, the challenge you have, and you've already made it clear about 2045, but what are your current reflections of these challenges, specifically how you'll be able to how the Scottish Government will be able to finance things, other areas you see across the piece, uh, retrofitting as well, for example, uh, might be something you'd pull out. Yeah, uh, so, so um, I mean, just to say, I mean, the financing requirements are, are large and investment levels would need to go up to get to that, that, you know, that 2045 target. And quite frankly, we, we, we do know that uh, the Scottish Government, or indeed any government, does not have deep enough pockets just to, just to pay for everything. And I think the area in which you know, our colleague Nick Robbins, who, who specialises on finance on the Commission, would emphasise the fact that the challenge is to use public sector finance cleverly to le leverage up uh, financing from the private sector. And that needs some attention to the risk. Basically, the public sector would need to take some of the risk out of the projects to provide the confidence for the private sector finance to come in. I think there's, there's a lot of tricky issues to you know, to be addressed here. I mean, the, some of the best progress in Scotland has actually been made in terms of social housing, where you know, where, where you have housing trusts that are, uh, you, you can can take very active activity. It's much tougher in the question of owner occupiers in the private rented sector, uh, where the challenges are bigger. And quite frankly, if you're going to be fair about it, because some of the owner occupiers will be getting the benefits of lower bills in the future, they should be expected to put, you know, to put up some of the money for it as well. And I think these are all the challenges we look forward to when we, we see the draft plan on buildings and construction and can really get our teeth into it. Yeah, I mean, I feel as though this is an absolutely massive area, so I'm not going to labour it because everyone else wants to come in the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Graham Simpson to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank, thanks very much, convener, and uh, good, good morning to the witnesses. Um, I'll start off by uh, saying that it's been incredibly refreshing to read um, two reports from the, from the Commission, which are actually written in plain English, and uh, actually say, say things, say what's wrong, and say what should be done. Um, we're not used to seeing reports like that from bo bodies like yours, so that's a, a note of praise. Um, I want to ask you about transport, because transport's mentioned in, in both your uh, reports from uh, 2020 and uh, indeed this year. Um, in the, the report, your initial report that you produced this year, you talk about a broken transport system. It's quite, it's quite tough language. Broken, ta broken transport system. Uh, you say Scotland's public transport net network requires vast improvement and must be made more affordable. Uh, and it requires significant investment from government and reprioritization of funds. So I, I just wonder if you can expand on that, and I'll ask you some more questions around what you've said as well. Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll pass over to Elliot on, on this in a second. Uh, but just, just to flag that, of course, uh, moving to electric vehicles is part of the solution, but, it, but it's absolutely not all of it. And I have to say, electric vehicles is one of the areas uh, where we have our we are paying attention in terms of who pays, because these are expensive things to buy up front, and people on lower incomes may not have the may not be able to take the benefit of them because they they find it more difficult to to raise the money. So the question of you know the electrification of transport is there. 
but I think a lot of the a lot of the comments on it came from perceptions about the public transport system, and obviously one of the threats after co the COVID crisis was, in, in a sense, the degree of confidence in public transport went down, and it is ve a very important part of the picture that if we are going to get to net zero in 2045 and get a credible contribution from the transport sector, we do think public transport will have to play a significant part of it. Uh, and so it's just to flag things like uh, rural bus services, for example, where it may be less appropriate for people to have electric vehicles. And one of the prompts also was actually from the visit uh, to Peterhead in the northeast earlier this year, where it was noted that Peterhead was one of the largest towns in the UK that does not have access to the rail network. And there could be implications there if you're trying to develop big projects for not having that kind of rail access. I don't know if Elliot wants to come in on this because I think he was more closely involved with the transport working group that uh, brought up some of these recommendations. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think just to underline a couple of other um, factors that were kind of front and centre in in terms of the deliberations that the working group um, went through, and it, as I think you'll have seen from the report, the th the thinking there is really around um, some of the opportunities that the Commission was able to see when thinking about, you know, what does a what does a decarbonised transport system look like for Scotland, and what should it look like for Scotland, um, and and some of the other issues as well as those that Jim mentions there, um, I think are, are crucially around accessibility, um, having a transport system that really is fit for purpose for kind of door to door journeys for people with disabilities. Um, the North East was highlighted. Um, as, as a kind of, as I think a structural risk, the lack of a of a rail link um, to Peterhead in particular was pinpointed, um, and then the kind of remote and rural point as well, and that was really underlined in the commission's visit to to Lewis um, back in October when we we heard um, about the consistent issues that islanders experience with um, with transportation and particularly the threat that this poses to, or the risk that this poses to. To business, um, particularly businesses like shellfish, for example, um, there, there's there's a, a high level of risk there when transport systems can't be relied upon to to deliver for them. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, no, I noticed you'd. Yeah, I mean, I read the obviously read the section. You focus on um, the the sort of rural parts of Scotland and how poorly served they are in in many respects. <clears throat> you mentioned ferry services in, in, in the report. Um, you've obviously been out to an island. Um, I just wonder what you... It, it can't all be about money, can it? There must be... Do, do you have any thoughts about how we might restructure the transport system? That's a big question, of course. Elliot, could, could, so, sorry, could you throw me a lifeline on that very big question? Yes. Um, I think I think a little bit, as Jim has has said in relation to one of the other plans. I think on on a question like that, the Commission there's further work that the Commission needs to do, and particularly in terms of how how the Commission looks to respond to the draft um, transition plan for transport, so that the Commission is clear on what what the Scottish Government has in mind, um, and then can, can can look to push the government further. Oh, that was a very short answer, Elliot. You rig, rig, tried to wriggle out of that one. Um, so yeah. let let's us, let's assume that the uh, the Just government. Just to say, it's, it's, as as secretary, it's difficult for me to. You know, I, I can only kind of uh, convey the views of the the commission as they've as they've been kind of discussed and agreed. Um, so I, I wouldn't I really wouldn't want to go beyond that into anything that's felt like more speculative territory for me. Yeah, and maybe I could just add to that. It's also not possible, even even if you're chair, uh, to to give the commissions on views that things that we haven't talked about. Uh, so you know that initial report that we we sent out in the summer was very much to stake out the territory. We felt it would be wrong to wait for eighteen months, you know, for our first annual report to come out. So it is it is not a deep dive into the particular topics and. Uh, the transport working group, for example, may have discussed in a bit more detail what the transport issues, but what is there in that initial report is pretty much what we've got so far. Okay, that's that. That's fair enough. Um, 
can I can I just ask you one more thing then on on that transport section? Um, <clears throat> you say that you think there should be an overhaul of regional and local public transport provision and infrastructure. I mean, did you go into any detail on on that? I mean, what what is it you mean by that? I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass to Elliot on that one again, who I think was involved with the Transport Working Group much more than I was. Yeah, I, I think just to say again, these, these are kind of initial very high level um, kind of strategic uh, fears from the, from the Commission on this, um, with the intention of digging into a lot more detail um, as we review the, the Transport Transition Plan from, from Scottish Government. Okay. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Colin Smith to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning to the panel. The, the, the Commission and, and, and many others have um, consistently called for greater clarity around the sort of pipeline of work that's required to transition to net zero. Can I ask, do, do we have a good understanding of, of the level of detail necessary to deliver the certainty that the industry is calling for on what work will be needed in order to deliver? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think if you take the energy sector as an example, I mean, what, what we're going to need to know is the kind of rollout of offshore and onshore wind so that we get a clear idea of the amount of construction activity that's actually actually going to be needed. I think it's possible to do that. It depends a bit on, you know, the leasing uh, kind, of, kind of process that we see, because obviously that's done competitively. Uh, but once you've got that in place, I think you've got a few years ahead on which to plan things. I think it would be very fair to say that our union colleagues on the Commission, uh, although there has been big success in the terms of the, you know, the kind of the gigawatts of, of wind energy that has been put up, there's been much more disappointment about the extent to which that has resulted in high quality jobs in Scotland as opposed to elsewhere. So I think uh, you, the importance of getting that kind of planning and specificity is that it would allow people in Scotland to make appropriate plans you know, for scaling up activity, for bidding for contracts, and equally for the procurement to take account of, of local content issues to make sure that the jobs actually arrive. And uh, as part of this new energy um, you know, kind of transition, we are going to see the jobs becoming available in Scotland. It is perfectly possible, in instance, to project the number of jobs and the skill levels that would be associated with a rollout, for example, of wind energy offshore and onshore. So, 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 but, so the, the, the main issue is, 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 is the certainty on that pipeline of work. Is there anything else that we need to do to make sure we don't make those mistakes of the past on, on, on energy, in particular that the, the unions are rightly concerned about that, that renewable companies say, well, we'd like to use Scottish businesses, but, and then they go and award those contracts to companies abroad. I mean, what, what other barriers do we, need to, uh, do we need to break down apart from just giving that certainty of work? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I think the you know the companies that that have been contracting have have uh, sort of developed some sense of contrition about about some of the things that have happened so far, and have have, have actually started to modify procurement uh, practices that takes account of more of local content on making sure that there are, are community benefits uh, from from the, the the kind of work they do. It's also very important not just to look at the demand for projects, but look at the supply of the skills as well. So I think to match that, it is also important that there's a lot of attention to the skills agenda, so that Scottish companies are in a good place to bid for these contracts uh, when, when they actually come through. So I think it's a, you know, a, plug, a plug in the socket. You know, we need to make sure we've got the skills to actually succeed in these competitions, and the competitions themselves need to be more sensitive uh, to, to the need for, for local content and the impact on local communities. It, it, it's interesting. Skill, skills obviously one, but I mean, are, are there any other barriers um, that, that the supply chain businesses are facing at the moment in order to make sure that they can access this, this potential, huge potential of work, obviously make sure they've got the workforce in place? I mean, is there any other barriers that, that need to be broken down around the supply chain themselves to make sure that the, um, they, they, they can, they can fulfil these? And I'm interested just... You mentioned local content. Obviously, Scotland's probably the best example of, 
of um, you know opportunities that we have. Um, the, the focus was on the companies effectively coming up with development plans around supply chain jobs. But I was interested in your point earlier about um, conditionality around local content. Is that something we should be driving a lot more, or should we just be continuing to leave it to the companies to decide how much local content they want? Because that appears to be the approach to Scotland. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass it over to Elliot in a second. But just one thing on the, the conditionally, conditionality elements. There are some issues about compliance with World Trade Organization rules uh, uh, around these issues. And obviously, you know, when, when we were part of the European Union, there, there were also uh, conditions around, around that as well. So I, I think you need to be quite careful about how far you go to, to avoid uh, bre breaching, you know, kind of state aid rules, which uh, still apply, you know, at WTO level as, as well as, uh, as at the European Union level. Well, I don't wonder if Elliot has anything he could add to that. Um, I think just to, one phrase that has, has kind of resonated in, uh, within the Commission's deliberations on these topics came from Rachel McEwen from SSE, um, who likes to talk about Scotland over the next over the coming decades as, as a workshop. Um, and in terms of the kind of broad planning, um, she's her her challenge is then to think: well, who is doing what, where? Um, so there's the, the kind of locational element to this as well, I think, to, to make sure that there is um, an appropriate regional distribution in terms of the, the kind of new, new areas of the, of the economy that are emerging and new industries to make sure that there isn't a, a kind of over-concentration in familiar areas um, and that the remote and rural communities in particular are, are, are benefiting from this in the long term. As somebody who represents a very rural area in the south of Scotland, um, I will agree entirely with what Rachel um, has said. But so, how how do we deliver that? I mean, how you know we've got this conflict of you can't um, rules may suggest that we can't put huge conditionality on that. So, how do we do that? Is it just about making sure that our supply chains are fit for purpose, and we're investor in the ports, we're investor in the companies? Is that the, the only route? Because ultimately, the the driver for renewable companies will be price. That will be the main driver. Um, we do have a you know, desire to see electricity produced as cheaply as possible. It's a kind of conflict there. Produce it cheaply, but then try and use a local supply chain that's more expensive. So how, how do we make sure we get what Rachel's asking for, others are asking for? What policy interventions do we do we fundamentally need? I mean, I appreciate that. It's a very, very detailed question. Probably a commission in itself. Yeah, maybe maybe I, I can try to, to address that one. I mean, it's... Uh, it's really interesting that SSE as a company is one of, as far as I know, almost the only company globally uh, to actually have a just transition plan and strategy by itself. And obviously that then drives the company to take more account of these issues, be more sensitive to these issues about local content, distribution of benefits than one that does not have such a strategy. And I think, uh, you know, a, a role for government potentially, I mean, you can't make companies do things like that. I mean, well, perhaps you could introduce legislation uh, you know, to require you, you know, just transition to be formalized in company plans. But there are ways of, of uh, kind of encouraging, nudging, shaming companies into take, paying more attention to just transition principles, you know, when they're actually implementing uh, their strategies. And SSE, I think, is very interesting. I mean, they were parading their just transition pl planning all around uh, you know, COP27 in, uh, in uh, Egypt last week. And they have got attention globally for doing it. And I think that's the, the kind of pressure. If you can build momentum around that trend where private companies are actually engaged with it, I, th I think that, that would be a good platform for success. Thank you. Um, Gordon McDonald, be followed by Colin Beatty. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I, I noticed in your July report under the list of strategic priorities that one of the items was tackling fuel poverty and that there was an action required for energy efficiency to be that was urgently needed. And I was just wondering if you could say what the current bottlenecks are that's holding back progress on energy efficiency improvements? Is it shortage of labour, shortage of materials or finance? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, again, I'll, I'll turn to Elliot in a, in a second on that. But um, the, 
But this is an area that ought to be so easy because there's a kind of triple win there. You can reduce emissions, reduce fuel poverty, and create you know, quite highly skilled jobs by, by making progress in this area. But the challenges are there and the bottlenecks. So I think the first one is that the, uh, the level of retrofit that you need uh, to actually aim for net zero is much, much more ambitious than just putting a few few extra centimetres of, of insulation into, into the attic. It's much more ambitious than that. And it needs greater skills in the building and construction sector uh, you know, to be able to do that. The skills is one part of it. Then, obviously, the finance, finance issue is, is, is an interesting one as well. Uh, we have had successes in the social housing sector, which we, we saw on, on the first Just Transition Commission. But it is that challenge. I mean, we need to get owner-occupiers to be ready to put up some of their own money as well with the, with the, you know, through, through the right kind of incentives. And perhaps in the private rented sector, there might be a possibility for more regulatory uh, interventions, you know, when tenancies uh, t t turn over, that kind of thing. So we, we, we need, we need a, you know, a, a big kind of push on this to make it happen. I mean, I, I've been in this business so long. I've watched uh, ministers come in looking at energy efficiency, look at it and say, oh, God, this is so obvious. Why has nobody thought of this before? And uh, you know, they're full of confidence about how to do it. And two years later, they retire defeated because of the, the kind of you know, the social institutional challenges in the sector. But it is such an obvious one to fix. We need to address it really urgently. Otherwise, we will not get to net zero in a, in a country like Scotland. And one other thing, just, just to flag, I mean, we had a session with building uh, professionals in Blantyre at best, and very much uh, the, the message that was coming through there was that it should be fabric first. Concentrate on the energy efficiency aspect of buildings, and then you can make what a choice of which kind of heating system you want to do, whether it's dis district heating in dense urban areas or perhaps heat pumps in other places. But get the efficiency sorted, because it's the key to unlocking everything. I think, Elliot? yeah, thanks, Jim. If I can just add a, a couple of things to that, um, and I think particularly reflections off the back of our most recent visit to, to the Isle of Lewis, um, where we heard not only from, from local organizations that are engaged in uh, energy efficiency measures, but also we, we held a town hall in Stornoway, uh, a town hall event where we heard from um, local citizens. Um, and, and one of the, one of the, the main themes, I would say, of that of that event was um, a growing frustration um, at the sense that local people had that they were sitting um, with an enormous amount of power being generated um, in their local area, um, and then they were looking at rates of fuel poverty um, on Lewis climbing towards est estimates around 80 80 percent plus. Um, so clearly, the, the, there's a, there's a dis the disjuncture there between how power is being generated and how um, the local community are, are able to to benefit um, from this in a in a sustainable way. And the the other key issue that was highlighted um, was was really around skills and access to skills in remote and rural areas. Um, so people were telling us about experiences of trying to trying to retrofit homes, um, but essentially being right at the at the bottom of the list of um, of providers who were operating within the central belt and for whom the, the costs of going to a remote island community like Lewis were obviously prohibitive relative to, to what they could do closer to home. Um, so I think there's a number of issues there just to, to highlight on that. Jim, did you want to come back? No, no, no it's okay. okay. Yeah. So what we've touched this morning a couple of times about finance and you, you quite rightly pointed out that a uh, owner-occupiers um, should contribute something. And in, in my constituency in Wester Hills, there's 100, currently 180 blocks being retrofitted with external cladding as part of a, an improvement to the, to the area. But homeowners, many of them whom are retired, are being asked between 40 and 60,000 pounds, which is a substantial uh, element to the value of the property. And the only option they're being given is to sell the property back to the council. So I was interested in your June minutes, which said there was a discussion on who pays for retrofit work. 
particularly those ineligible for warm work support at present due to benefit criteria, and it was suggested governments should look at other countries for solutions, <coughs> such as Germany and Italy, who both operate effective incentive schemes. So I was wondering if you could expand on, on that minute that you had in June. Yeah, I, I think uh, the reference to Germany was uh, uh, to the KFW uh, bank, which, uh, which provides funding. And basically, Germany has spent roughly the same amount of money on energy efficiency as the UK has in aggregate, but they've strategised it uh, very, very differently, and that they've focused on doing very deep retrofits on a smaller number of buildings rather than doing modest retrofits, you know, so attic insulation, etc., uh, you know, on a large number of, of buildings, which has been the Scottish and the, and the UK pattern uh, so far. So, as I recall, uh, I'm sorry, it's a while since I looked at that, KFW was providing uh, funds, uh, sort of zero interest loans on about, up to about 60 or 70,000 euros, if I recall, on deep retrofits on buildings that were, were, were available to people. So they were taking rather, rather a different approach with it. And KFW is probably in the same kind of bracket as the, as the SNIB, the Scottish National Investment Bank, in that it gets its funds from, from kind of social security payments. It's not entirely on the uh, you know, part of the private market. So I think these are the kind of examples that we, that, that we need to look to. And I guess the other thing on the owner occupier is to look at the points of intervention when you make a difference. You know, when you buy or sell a house, you know, is there something that can be put in there? Can you get discounted mortgages if, if there is more energy efficient measures put in? So I think looking at the intervention points and looking at for, you know, kind of cleverer ways of setting the incentives for people has got to be there. And just to, just to say, I mean, I can, I can entirely sympathize, you, you know, as I'm approaching that age myself, of you know, you, you're getting into into retirement, uh, you know, facing uh, you, you know big retrofit costs. How do you actually manage it? And that's the very reason that we need to be sensitive about the who 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 pays, on whom who will gain the benefits, uh, etc. Which is part of the you know one one of our uh, sort of main themes for the just transition. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, by um, Jimmy Halko Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Um, just a couple of related questions I'd like to ask. We're all aware that uh, Scotland has an ageing population, and the latest projections seem to indicate that the, the working age population will shrink over the medium to long term. What additional challenges does that bring to achieving the, the kind of upskilling and reskilling? that we need to do with the workforce? Uh, and are they ready to take the new jobs and new markets that will support the transition? How is this going to work? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. We, well, this is not an issue. We haven't discussed uh, ageing population issues within the Commission, uh, though it would, it would be part of our kind of, kind of social infrastructure theme. I mean, quite clearly, people you know, need to be it may be that people will work beyond current retirement ages and change the balance of people who are in retirement or, or part of the part of the working population. I mean, I'm past the state state retirement age and not showing any signs of slowing up at the moment. But I, I wouldn't give myself as an example on that. But I think it's a good thing. It's, it's something that we ought to ought to discuss because we have not covered it, uh, you know, specifically in the commission discussions. I don't know, Elliot, if anything has come up in, in terms of some of the working groups and some thinking around there. Yeah, I think it just it would just be to highlight that the that in terms of how how the just transition is to be understood and um and, and work towards in the Scottish context, that this commission has taken a very strong steer that that social infrastructure piece, which would include uh, care, health. Um, the kinds of things on which we all we all rely on, perhaps particularly as we get older, um, but that has to, that has to be part of the picture, not a um, kind of marginal um, c concern. I think, um, but in that sense, the, the the work of the commission that's that's more the kind of um, horizon scanning, um, agenda setting, advisory piece that Jim was talking about earlier. It doesn't as yet align, align with um, 
Scottish Government just transition plans. As far as we are aware, there isn't, for example, a just transition plan um, for, for health, for example. Um, but it's been highlighted by the Commission, I think, that um, that part of what a new economy looks like is 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 really valuing um, these these low emission sectors that are are um, that sustain the economy and help the economy to to reproduce and function well. I think if the, the, perhaps it would be unwise to just assume that uh, older workers are going to come back to the workforce to make up the shortage. Uh, I realise that the cost of living crisis is forcing many to continue beyond their retirement age, uh, but that may not prevail into the future. It's not something you can plan. But again, I would come back to um, we've got a shrinking, all the projections say we have a shrinking working age population. That's going to have a direct impact on the jobs and so on around the transition. How, how is that going to work? How is the workforce yeah, going to uh, be managed? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just to say, one on the first Just Transition Commission, one of the first things we did was to commission uh, a piece of work on what Scotland might look like in 2030 in terms of o overall economic and social structures. And I have to say we couldn't make much use of the report because it was a business-as-usual projection. On 2045 and net zero is just not business-as-usual. I say that we have not thought, I have to confess, we have not thought through these issues, but it's a point that I think we need to be put just transition in that wider concept, context of where Scottish economy and society is going to go over that same period, because net zero is not the only thing that, 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 that is happening. I would need to take account of the other factors. So I'm afraid we don't have answers at this moment, but as with some of the other questions, you're kind of setting an agenda for us, which I think is rather useful. Perhaps I, can I think just, also just... perhaps I can just ask you another question, which is somewhat related to what I was uh, talking about. Do we have a, a sense of the, an understanding of the skills that will be in demand? And do we have enough confidence that a pipeline will exist to deliver these in time for investment in the coming years? Uh, I'll turn to Elliot again on this, but I think we have we, we, we can develop very good ideas of what kind of skills are going to be needed, and people are actually doing that the, you know, kind of skills mapping associated with net zero. I think the, the bigger challenge is is perhaps getting getting the the plans and the pipeline in place to make sure that these skills needs can actually be met. I mean, it's a message we're getting about shortages of skills, in fact, in some of the critical areas. So, so this is absolutely something that needs to be worked on. But uh, Elliot, uh, do, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, just, just to underline that, I think, particularly from this, this second commission, one of the clearest um, messages that the commission has sent to government is on this question, this critical question of workforce planning. Um, and obviously the age profile of the, work, the workforce and the skills that are required where and when, um, that, th those are very much the terms in which the commission is thinking that um, we need to have a lot more detail and a lot more clarity from government. So at this point, would it be correct to say that overall workplace planning across the country hasn't really taken place yet? I would say it's work in progress. I mean, people have acknowledged the need to do it and we are pressing government on it, but I think there's still work to be done on it. It's certainly an area that uh, could threaten the effective delivery of the transition if we don't have the right people with the right skills in the right numbers it must yeah be we can only agree we can only agree with you on that yeah okay thank you and um, could i just ask you know, i appreciate james Wothers has currently undertaken a skills inquiry uh, he, i think he's due to produce a report in april has he managed to have time to um, engage with the just transition commission yet Elliot, do, do you have any information on that? No, we haven't. We haven't had a connection there just yet. But I suspect that is something we will be exploring. Thank you. And just one other question before I move to Jamie. Um, the role of I mean, we had a, we've had a very broad discussion this morning, and it was the Commission's recommendation that a minister was appointed. Um, this is not a reflection on the minister um, personally, but do you think the ministerial role has enough weight? to have influence across government, given this is a very cross-cutting area? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think basically it's, it's too early to tell. I mean, this is a real experiment in, in governance, uh, you know, given, given the fact that, you know, that as we've described just transition today, it has a very, very wide scope. And so the minister has to, has to delve in all sorts, all sorts of different areas. I do think it's important that the Just Transition Commission itself doesn't only engage with the Just Transition portfolio, but engages with other parts, you know, you know, like, like the economy and fair, fair work part of it, uh, environment and land reform is another area in which, in fact, I have engaged with the, with the Cabinet Secretary on this topic. We do need to, to go in there. And I, I think uh, the combination of a, a critical friend in the Just Transition Commission and having a minister in there is a it has, is potentially very powerful, but we will need to come back in two or three years' time to check whether this this is a genuine experiment in terms of governance for just transition. I don't know any other country in the world that has a, a just transition minister, uh, for example. And I was asking a few countries when it was in Egypt last week. Uh, so I, I, I think we wait and see. I mean, it's worthwhile trying. We were very keen to see the just transition elevated within and given a, a very specific spotlight within the uh, governance system. And I think we will find out in two or three years whether that's worked or not. Um, Jamie, how that's could not... Sorry, continue, yeah. Professor. Yeah, I was just going to say that's not something I should turn to Elliot on as, uh, as one of the, <laughs> the, 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 the secretary. Yeah. Yep, we don't want to compromise them in any way. Uh, Jamie, how could Johnson to be followed by Fiona Heslop? Um, thanks very uh, thanks very much and good morning um, to you both. Um, I just wanted to ask them, um, just before I kind of go on to the main points, we've talked about fuel poverty um, and the issues around owner occupiers and, and social housing. I represent the Highlands and Islands, which include, as you mentioned, Lewis, but also Orkney and Shetland, where there's high levels of fuel poverty and a frustration, as you mentioned, about a huge amount of uh, renewable generation in those areas. Um, one of the issues that's come up uh, in my time as an MSP has been sometimes a lack of clarity in how particularly owner occupiers can get support, um, how they can access. There are lots of different ways, lots of different pots as issues related to income and, and uh, health uh, issues and uh, uh, age of house, all sorts of different things. So going forward in that area, particularly fuel poverty, but perhaps others as well, how important is it that, that clarity, uh, you know, a streamlined process, easy access to the right information, good signposting, how important will that be um, to meeting these targets? Well, I mean, this is my personal view. I don't think we talked about it, you know, when we were actually over in Stornoway specifically. Uh, but I think the, the, the question of clarity for me is, is absolutely critical because complex administrative processes and bureaucracies simply discourage people from applying. We're well aware that people end up not taking, not taking benefits they're entitled to if the obstacles and the administrative hurdles are just too high. So I can only say that it is very important. I think if you simplify procedures, uh, you have to accept that there may be a little, rough, a little more rough justice in terms of the decisions that are made. But that is a, a kind of a choice I think we need to make. Maybe a bit more rough justice would be acceptable if, if we can uh, actually make, make bro greater progress and get more people in, engaged. Thank you for that. Um, another area that um, uh, we've heard concerns or there have been concerns around has been the involvement of small, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, uh, and particularly how we engage with um, um, small businesses. I wonder if you could perhaps talk more about the concerns that you might have or how you see how important you yeah. see that. Yeah, I'm going to see if Elliot can can deal deal with us when it's not one of the topics I've I've done a deep dive into on the commission. E Elliot, do you have any ideas on that? Um, could you tell us a bit more about what you have in mind just on that? Like, um, are you are you talking in terms of uh, just transition? I mean, one one way that just transition is is playing out is through different organisations at, at different levels um, developing their own just transition plans. Is that the kind of Thing you're you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I mean going back in the kind of history on areas around um, uh, um, you know, energy efficiency and other <clears throat> and other areas, it's tended to be a focus on larger organisations that can deliver, uh, you know, Scotland wide. Whether that's actually delivering some of the projects or the or, or the initiatives, but obviously you know, encouraging small businesses to play their role in reducing energy use and, 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 um, and the like is going to be key to meet, meeting some of these kind of wider targets. So I suppose it's how you take 
how you encourage sm small businesses to be involved in that, how they play a role, how they can, uh, how they can be engaged with on that? Yeah, rather as Jim is, is suggesting, I think it's not something the Commission has looked at in a huge amount of detail just yet, um, but I think it is something that we'll consider down the road. I think kind of at the same the same question of scale, there was a really interesting um, discussion on, on Lewis about the relationship between community um, community wind and 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 much you know larger corporate um, wind generation. And I think there's there's definitely right across the just transition question in Scotland there is there is an interesting balance here to be had between um, you know small smaller operations and larger ones. Right. Maybe I could, I've just recalled something, a conversation we, we had uh, when we were on Lewis around this particular issue on energy efficiency, which related to a requirement, I think, in Scottish government procurement to use the past 2060 standard, I think it, I think it was, for, uh, for, for suppliers of energy efficiency services. And we, we had a lot of grief that this was very difficult and was not suited for smaller to medium-sized enterprises to deal with, and tilted you towards take it, taking uh, you know larger suppliers who could put in place more elaborate procedures. And you know it was quite quite clear from looking at the British Standards Institution uh, documentation uh, that this was very much the intention. They did want more uh, larger, potentially more sophisticated operators involved in the process. And I think this is actually. I mean, we we did identify this as an issue. Perhaps is the possibility for a slightly more streamlined approach uh, to the application of these kind of standards and procurement processes, so that sm eh, smaller to medium-sized enterprises that would tend to dominate in places like Lewis would not be so disadvantaged by by the, these sort of more bureaucratic kind of interventions. It's a point we take we took home, and it is likely, I think, to appear in some of the reports we come out with next year as, as an issue. Thank you. Maybe we want to keep an eye on that. Um, I suppose the kind of last point I was looking at was, uh, you know, we are. Well, I think we're all agreed on, or we all understand the need um, for uh, just transition around energy and um, uh, and the moves and the impact that's going to have, particularly on um, some kind of key areas of the energy sector uh, or on how that might shift in Scotland. But there are other sectors that we've mentioned as well today. Housing has been one. Um, agriculture. Um, we, I'm a partner in a farming business, and you know, I can see the changes that are already being made. Within housing, we need to build more houses and we need to uh, provide more homes for people. Within agriculture, um, we've spent many years uh, you know, incorporating environmental issues within, uh, within farming practices, but we now see food prices increasing. We, need, we, need, uh, we see pressure in terms of supply. How, how will some of those kind of conflicting interests perhaps impact on, um, on, the, on the work and what, what can be delivered in terms of a just transition and perhaps on the work and recommendations that you might make? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at it first and maybe, maybe pass to Elliot. Uh, but you know, on, the, on the housing issues on new build, I mean, it is, it is absolutely essential that when, when new build takes place, it is built to the absolutely highest standards. I mean, I was involved in the IPCC report that came out this year on reducing emissions, which is very clear that in all parts of the world, it's possible to build almost net zero buildings. And we should be aspiring to that. I know Lord Deben, who's chair of the Com Committee on Climate Change, it's his words rather than mine, is actually quite scathing about the major house builders and, and you know, the kind of housing that we're putting up at the moment that is locking in carbon dioxide emissions you know, for decades into the future. So it's really important for new build that we get a grip on the, on the standards there. Agriculture and land use, I think uh, you know, there's an awful lot of townies, if I can put it that way, on the Just Transition Commission. We hold our hands up there. And I think we are just uh, humbled, actually, by the complexity of some of the issues around agriculture you, you know, and land use, you know, when a tenancy comes to an end, who do the trees belong to? Who do the cattle belong to? These kinds of issues, which is why I think agriculture and land use is also very much tied up to the land reform issue that uh, we, we, you know, we, we really need to get our heads around. And we do have experts in agriculture and land use on the Commission who will help us think our way through these problems. I don't know, uh, Elliot, if you have anything to add to that on housing and land. 
Um, yeah, I mean, just very quickly on housing, it was, it was, I really appreciate the, the comments from members earlier about how accessible our, our July report was in terms of plain English. There was some rather unparliamentary language on, um, on the standards for new house, house building um, that had to, had to be judiciously <laughs> edited, I think, Jim, you might remember, um, which I won't quote in, in, this, in this session. Um, and then, yeah, just to say, just to say on, on, on agriculture and land use, I think there again, um, the challenge for, for the Commission um, is, I think, to take account of, of, the, of the different scales at which different, different, um, different businesses and different operations are, are working. Um, and so in Lewis, it was great to hear from, from local crofters. Um, and, and they were really pushing the, this, this notion of peripherality um, as an important principle when thinking about um, the development of plans, plans that, um, for, for just transition that is not necessarily that, you know, that they make, um, obviously none of these plans can, can, can just invent um, some, some kind of perfect new system. Um, but it's about identifying where where the key risks are and making sure that the that the burden um, of these changes is not falling on those le least able to shoulder the, those burdens um, and where there might be particular vulnerabilities that that can be addressed and and, and recognised and mitigated. That's right. Um, that Thanks very much. I mean, I, th I think the issue around who inherited trees is probably less of a concern in places like Orkney and Shetland, where I'm from. But uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, that, but I'm sure they, I'm sure the local uh, sectors would welcome a visit because I mean th these are important issues. Um, I'm also interested in FOI to find out what this parliamentary, unparliamentary language is, so we get a good, <laughs> honest appraisal of your thoughts. But thank you. I'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you, uh, Fiona Hill. Uh, thank you, and I should pro probably point out I'm the only. Uh, MSP that sits on both the, this committee, the Economy and Fair Work Committee, but also the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. And Professor Skew, you've obviously given evidence to, to that committee as well. So I'm interested in how we um, dial up the just transition focus in this committee and respect the, what the other committee might be looking at, for example, the land use, land reform, transport areas. Um, so I think it's how do we how do we do that read across? And I'm I wanted to ask um, specifically about the Just Transition Fund, which exists for the North East and Murray, which in and of itself is obviously focusing and making a decision on a place-based uh, approach to Just Transition. Um, and did your uh, commission advise the government in advance of the announcement of the initial 50 million funding for the 24 projects in the, in the first tranche? Yeah, I mean, so so just on the first point about the intersection with this committee in particular, I for for me it is actually on the on the classic uh, just transition issues of labour market skills and training, and that I think would be, would be for where the focus would be. There's obviously some intersection with other con uh, with, with other committees because you know the you know, the training needs, skills needs, etc. will be very specific to individual sectors and the, there's a crossover there but for me it's classic just transition skills training labor markets you know you know where we where, where we have the issues here on the just transition fund uh, I only yesterday took a look at the at the projects that had been funded and I personally had had no involvement uh, you know with the with, with, with the the way that these individual projects uh, were, were selected. Obviously, it's a significant amount of money, about 50 million altogether, with a, quite a big variation in the size of the awards. I think they vary from about 100,000 to seven, eight million, may, maybe is the kind of the top end of the range. But we had had no interest. We had had no involvement in that so far. And I think one of the the things. I mean, this is me talking personally off the top of my head. Uh, we can't, uh, I think, really get involved in discussing the merits of individual projects, but I think we would have an interest in the criteria that are used to actually select uh, wh which projects go forward, and perhaps also some of the governance issues around, you know, how the how the selection process actually works. I don't know, Elliot, if you, you may have heard something, because you're perhaps closer to the Scottish government on this than I am, but, uh, you know, um, I think just to underscore that the the remit of this commission is really is really focused on the on the development of just transition plans. Um, so there isn't a specific aspect of the remit that tasks the commission to provide um, oversight of 
of the Just Transition Fund. Um, the commissioners and the commission as a whole, I think, is 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 interested and is follow, following this with interest, um, and would be would be happy to provide scrutiny and advice if if that's what the Scottish government would, would like from us. So, on the basis that the the plans that are there, the projects that are there are all very good and worthy in and of themselves. Uh, some of them are more probably focused on delivery of net zero as opposed to necessarily just transition. And I think that's going to be a kind of, um, I suppose, an obvious uh, fault line between when you're trying to generate um, that transition as opposed to focusing on the just aspect of it in terms of the fairness and in terms of um, those principles that, that you established. So I suppose the, the, the question then is, if there is to be funding for just transition, um, should it be mainstreamed um, in the areas that you've heard already from housing, from energy, from transport, and or indeed from private companies? Um, or is, is there merit then in having standalone just transition plans um, that are then supported by funds? And if those funds then have a criteria, is that something the Commission would advise on? And if you did have, is that something you've you've thought of? If you're advising on the just transition plans for sectorally, are you also advising about how any funding and the criteria for funding, or is that still work in progress? Yeah. So, so just to say on that, I can, I can probably open up more as chair of the Commission rather than Elliot, who, who's on the on the Secretariat, but we are a, a Commission that is independent of the Scottish Government. And if we chose to provide proactive advice on this on a topic like this, I don't see any obstacle to us actually doing that. And given the fact that the Commission has not met, obviously, since this funding, the, the, this funding was announced, I am perfectly sure that it will come up at you know, the next Commission meeting that we actually have. And I would think it is relevant and it is within the broad remit of the Commission uh, to, to you to consider how funding is being applied and the degree to which it is the, the justice bit or the transition bit that's been addressed in the, in, in the funding streams. And you, you know, what, what you raised there about the issue about whether, uh, you know, as it were, a, a labelled just transition fund or, or a, as opposed to merging just transition principles into all other sources of funding is one that we need to kick around. This is genuinely one uh, that the Commission has not considered yet. And I think, you know, it is new information for us, you know, what the, that portfolio of projects looks like. Yeah, so I, I think that's something that the committee would be, be be interested in. We've got to determine what we want to do as a committee, and you might want to advise us actually as to what we could most usefully do, because there's no point in us repeating um, work that you're doing, but we need to work in synergy somehow. And I suppose the challenge then is um, just transition if we are, you know, doing things which are quite innovative uh, uh, globally and in, in, in how we're approaching it. Um, it's, we have to make decisions that are, are choices and they're difficult choices. And I suppose the issue then is, um, would we need to, in Scotland to, to make big and bold decisions with what we do on just transition or will piecemeal, um, you know, segmented uh, activity uh, that seed corn for other you know, sources of funding be a way forward? And, and I think that is a genuine dilemma. Is that something that the Commission has discussed? Yeah. No, we, we, have, we have not discussed this. I mean, it's worthwhile saying on the first Just Transition Commission, it was surprising how little we talked about funding and how much more we talked about doing things smarter or better. And that's in very sharp contrast for things like Just Transition within the EU Green Deal, where the financial flows have just completely dominated the discussion. And I do think we, you know, we've got a finance working group, uh, which Nick Robbins is leading for us, and these are the kind of issues we need, need to pick up. I think that the focus of that group so far has been much more on the role of bodies like the, you know, the Scottish National Investment Bank and how you leverage private funding. But the Just Transition funding is straight grant-based, as, as, as far as I can see. And that's a different approach to, you know, to finance, which we, I think we need to get, 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 our, get our heads around. And I'll certainly be raising it with the Commission at our next meeting. 
And just finally, I think there's, there is an issue about skills, uh, absolutely, which this committee can focus on. But some of the skills that need to be developed now may not then get to, may, may not then be delivered for projects till five years' time, etc. But if we don't start investing in the supply chain and developing those skills now, we won't necessarily then be able to deliver when the scale up of the uh, of the particularly renewables will, will happen and happen at pace and scale. So the issue is how do we support uh, supply chain skills engineering companies, for example, to make those investments and decisions now when they might not necessarily re you know, reap the reward for that for five years' time. And there is something around that is a genuine transition um, challenge about how we support them to, to do that and that mean, may mean state subsidies so it's more thinking about in those terms is that something that your commission would look at or is it something potentially that we could look at? It, it, well, well it's, it's, uh, we think it's absolutely w within our remit and obviously we have, we have slightly different functions because you're scrutinising on the on behalf of the Scottish Parliament and we've get, given, been given this independent role So, and we've been we've been given the, the, you know, the, this kind of independent role, but but just to say, I, I mean, this is one we need to follow up. And why we have absolutely emphasised the need for uh, you know sector plans and roadmaps to take us forward, because we cannot wait until uh, needs manifest themselves before investing <laughs> in supply chain. We need to be anticipatory, given the the short length of time till till twenty forty five. And that means, you know, you know, scaling up in, van, uh, in advance in terms of supply chains. So the question we, we frankly, uh, we, we have not addressed these issues specifically yet in a, in a uh, commission meeting that I can recall. Uh, but you know, again, it, it's absolutely one on the agenda. I mean, and just to say, in the last sort of you know hour, hour uh, or so, I think there are many, many issues which actually it's been very helpful for us. To hear the concerns of, of MSPs about particular topics that might be relevant, and certainly Elliot and myself will be taking that back. Uh, that you, you know, the, the bring these issues back to the the Commission when we next meet. Thank, uh, thank Elliot, you. is there anything else you want to say on that? Yeah, no, just to underline, I think I, I hope there would be a really productive um, relationship going forward between the the Commission and the Committee. I think there's there's a significant overlap in terms of. Um, the, the priorities on just transition that, that have emerged uh, from this conversation, and I think there could be productive uh, opportunities for for further exchange and collaboration. Thank you very much. I think that's probably an appropriate time to hand back to our committee convener. Um, thank you. I am going to allow Maggie Chapman in with a supplementary. That, thanks very much, Claire. J just one brief final question, if, if I may. Uh, Jim, you, 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 was, you were speaking quite a lot about social infrastructure, and I'm also mindful of the uh, task around meaningful engagement with those who are going to be most likely affected by, by the just transition to have the opportunity to shape that. And I'm wondering if there's, if there's um, something in, in that space that either you haven't done, are not planning to do, that, that maybe would be a role for, for, for the committee or, or, or vice versa. Because I think that there is something around that engagement, particularly with, with the, not the usual suspects, if we can say those who will directly be affected, but aren't, maybe don't have industry voice or don't have, ha have, have that kind of um, input into the, the structures that we have. Yeah, I mean, the, the not the usual suspects uh, issue is something we, that we've talked about quite explicitly, which is why we go into things like town hall meetings, uh, you know, when we go out uh, or, or on, our, on our various site visits. I should say that the question of social infrastructure, what I've mentioned, is something that has been the subject of some debate, uh, you, you know, within, within the Commission, uh, you know, the question about whether this is social infrastructure as a more broader and more conceptual approach, or whether it's more specifically about the social care sector, which, which for other reasons may well become more important in the Scottish Scottish economy. So I think this is something we need to work about. We need to clarify our thinking uh, on on the on this just a little, because I know we have received queries from the Scottish government about what we precisely mean by social infrastructure. And I think we need to get our thinking to be a little more rigorous on that topic. One area in which we emphasise that it could be quite important is if, for example, 
we look at climate change adaptation, then the question of social infrastructure with the physical impacts of climate change could become much more important. Uh, Elliot, is there anything you, you can add on that? Um, I think just on the engagement question, we do have our Equalities Participation and Engagement Working Group, and I think that question of of making sure that um, that it is it, it is not the usual suspects only that are that are inputting um, both in terms of the development of the plans, but also in terms of the monitoring and evaluation piece. And that was a really specific piece of advice to government from the Commission in the the July report on how they take forward their work on M&E was to, to go beyond um, the, to, to put in a, a specific piece of focus work to make sure that um, those most likely to be on the sharp end of, front of the transition um, as we go forward are, are part of that decision-making process and, and, and are heard from. Um, and I think that that working group will be looking to, to take forward that work and to, to find um, new ways of, of engaging in that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I would like to thank Professor Ski and Elliot Ross very much for giving us evidence this morning. It has been very helpful, and I do look forward to continuing a working relationship with the Commission. Um, I now move into private session.